It looks like everybody's done this before, but just a reminder, you'll want to keep your uh, mic muted unless you want us to hear everything that's going on in the, in the background of your location. And I actually have uh, five people sitting in my office listening in on this presentation as well. So it's 3.46, I'm going to get started. Um, this presentation I've done in usually 75 minutes, we have 60 minutes. So um, for those who don't know me, I'm Reverend Dr. Lisa Davison. I serve currently as the Interim Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean at Phillips Theological Seminary, where I am also the Johnny Ergel Kajo Professor of Hebrew Bible and the Director of Formation for our Disciples of Christ students. Um, I want to say up front, since I will be going fast to get everything in, that I do have a handout that I use with this presentation. Um, so if you would like a copy of the handout and the slides, if you'll just drop me an email, I'll make certain you get both of those. Um, and so you don't have to try and take notes if I'm moving really fast. So let's get started about what the Bible says or doesn't say about sexuality, gender, um, et cetera. I'm going to start with some very basic things just to remind us all and for you to know a little bit about how I approach the study of the Bible. If I were doing this live in a group, I would ask for ideas as to what is the Bible. Um, I've done this so many times that usually we get answers everything from the Word of God to the dusty book that we keep on the shelf, um, and in between, words of God, a library, a book about faith. Um, so I'm going to start with how I understand the biblical collection, um, and I actually I'm going to do what you shouldn't do. I'm going to do I'm going to start with what I don't think the Bible is. So the first thing I don't see the Bible as an objective history. That was not the purpose, I think, for the early storytellers, compilers, writers of the canon, but rather they were trying to tell the story of a particular group of people or peoples and how they understood the holy working in their lives and calling them to be more than they were. I also, you know, put objective in quotation marks because really we know there is no such thing as an objective history, even though it's in the nonfiction section of the library. Whenever one, someone sits down to write a history, they have to choose what events to include or exclude, and they have to decide how to interpret those events. I use the example of my experience. I grew up, unfortunately, uh, south of the Mason-Dixon line in the state of Virginia. And if I were to go to the library and check out two books on the Civil War, one written from a Northern author and one written from a Southern author, I would think that I was reading about two different wars. So not an objective history, if that even exists. It is also my belief, my uh, opinion, that the Bible was not written to be a science textbook, even though people like to turn to it to get scientific information. Um, we just on the surface, we need to understand that these texts were written, some of them 3,000, 5,000 years ago, with their limited knowledge of the world and the scientific breakthroughs and discoveries we've had since then. Um, it just isn't fair to ask the Bible to answer science questions from the 21st century. One of my favorite questions I get asked is, what does the Bible say about stem cell research? <laughs> and I am able to say, surely, with confidence, not a darn thing, because they didn't even know what a cell was. How could they talk about stem cell research? So it's not a history book or a science textbook. How do we understand or how do I understand what the Bible is? There are lots of examples I could use. These are a few that kind of work for me. Um, the Bible is a story or stories of people who claim a common heritage, common God, common hopes and dreams for the people of Israel in the Hebrew Bible and for the early uh, followers of the way of Jesus in the New Testament. Um, this is their story. 
accountability to create a, a fantasy or a false self-esteem to escape I what they think know. is a mundane life. There we go. They lie to avoid um, punishment. They lie to inflict pain, to feel better in the moment, steal admiration from. All right. Sorry, somebody wasn't muted. Um, the Bible is a theology book for certain. It's talking about God and humanity and creation, um, but it's not a systematic theology book. If you ask the question, who is God? If you look in four different places in the Bible, you'll find at least four or five different answers. Um, I think of the Bible as a roadmap that was left for us by previous generations, our faith ancestors, so that we would know we're not the first ones to walk this road of life, that we weren't the first one, we aren't the first ones to ask difficult questions like why are we here and what are we supposed to do? And so the roadmap helps us know that we're not the first and we won't be the last to walk this path and ask these questions. The Bible can also be seen as a mirror. That is, um, it's a place that you can read the story and you can look and find your place in the story. Who are you in this story? And when you read the same story over and over, you'll find you're in different places. One thing I do notice about particularly uh, privileged uh, Christians, myself included, is we tend to want to make ourselves into the um, the ones that God is fighting for, the oppressed. And I'm not certain that's a fair uh, observation for me or for others. Um, when I teach the story of the Exodus and um, Pharaoh and Moses and Aaron and Miriam, I tell folks that as a white, heterosexual, cisgendered, upper middle class female, I am not a Hebrew slave. At best, I am an Egyptian citizen who benefits from slave labor. And on my worst days, I'm Pharaoh who oppresses people for my own comfort level. So finding our place in the story requires us to be a bit honest. Um, the Bible is also a compilation of voices. We might even think of it as a library um, with all sorts of things that um, come from different times, different places, different perspectives. Um, we also know for certain that not all voices were included. Usually those voices excluded were voices of women and other marginalized groups. So whenever I read biblical texts, I'm always asking, whose perspective am I hearing and whose voice is being left out? And the last thing I will say about the Bible is that it's a dangerous book. And um, this is your first Hebrew lesson. Um, the word tame is a word that usually is translated as unclean, but really that is not the best definition or translation of tame. Um, this is a, a concept of the ancient world, uh, particularly those behind the Hebrew Bible, who believed that human beings walked around in a state of tahor or tahara. Um, which is your normal state that allows you to function. But along life's journeys, we encounter things that transform us into a state of Tame. So sometimes I think of Tahura as ordinary and Tame as extraordinary. Um, things that do this are things like encountering childbirth or death or other uh, liminal events in human existence. And the ancients believed that human beings couldn't tolerate a whole bunch of this altered state, this extra holiness. And so if you were transformed and were Tame, you had to separate from the community because Tame was catching in their mind. And you couldn't go into places like the Holy of Holies because they thought too much holiness would actually kill us or blow our heads up, however you want to put it. But the reason why I bring it up here is that when the second temple was destroyed by the Romans and the Jewish leaders got together to decide what would become their canon, they asked this question about the different scrolls that had been collected. Does the scroll make the hands unclean? Now, in our thinking, that would say, oh, it's secular and we need to leave it out. But remember, that word is tame. And so does it make the hands tame? 
If the answer is yes, it was kept because those stories, those scriptures have the ability to transform our lives. They are dangerous. We can use the text to give life or we can use these texts to deal death. I hope to always choose to try and le use the biblical text, interpret, teach, preach these texts in a way that gives life in the fullest of how I think the Holy wants us to experience divine shalom. So it's a cautionary tale. And I will say up front, not every story in the Hebrew Bible, at least, I think was recorded as a go and do likewise story. I think some were re recorded so we might learn from our ancestors' mistakes and not repeat them again. A um, couple of other basic questions that we ask. Uh, one is, who wrote the Bible? Um, there are basically three answers. Some people would say God wrote the Bible. That is, it fell from heaven in the King James English, might be one way of putting that. Um, God loved for so my mom often thought that way, or that maybe God held the stylus or the pen while humans were just the mere instrument of the divine writing. Another answer is that humans wrote the text. It was a purely human endeavor that had human agenda behind it in order to keep certain people in their places and to elevate others. The third answer sounds like you're writing the fence, but this is where I fall. Um, that it's a little bit of both, both divine and human. Um, the divine inspires, but the, it has to go through the human being, which makes it susceptible to biases, to limited vision, to context, and limited understanding of the world. And so, as I say, the holy is doing the best the holy can with the material that the holy has to work with. For me, the way the the text I imagine coming to be, the way I look at the Bible, is it was a divine human dance. And sometimes God leads, and we get wonderful texts like, love the stranger because you were a stranger. And sometimes the humans take the lead, and we get texts like, go and destroy all the Canaanites. So remembering that sometimes we may get a lot more divine inspiration and other times we might see a lot more human aspiration in it. That leads us to the question of authority. Um, we need to understand that, especially when it comes to the Bible, authority must be granted or recognized. It is not automatic. I think sometimes Christians uh, will be in the public square arguing things based on the Bible, and we don't understand why nobody wants to listen to us. Well, that's because for many people we're talking to, the Bible is not an authority for them. And even those who claim the Bible is authoritative, we have questions like, what kind of authority do we give it? How much authority? Do we consult the Bible before we make every choice in our lives? Do we even consider the Bible when we're making decisions about how to live, how to give our money and time? Um, I think sometimes um, we have to understand that we might think the Bible is our primary authority, but it may not always be. Some Christians and others have what we call a canon within a canon. That is, there are certain books or, or texts that we consider more authoritative than others. For many Christians I experience, the canon within the canon are the epistles, maybe Acts, um, not the Gospels, which always makes me laugh because I'm a follower of the way of Jesus, not the way of Paul. Um, we also, when we talk about biblical authority, want to consider also the reason, uh, the role of reason, tradition, and experience. It's not just the biblical text, but we think about it. We have traditions about reading and understanding texts, and we have lived experience that sometimes contradicts what the Bible may be appearing to tell us. Now, when I talk about the Bible and authority, one of the things that always comes up, and you may have met some people or claim to be a literalist uh, yourself, and if, that, if you do, that's fine, um, but here's what I have encountered with people who claim to be biblical literalists. They say the Bible is their primary or only authority. 
they say they don't interpret, they just read, which is kind of funny because you can't read if you're not interpreting what is being written on the page. They say biblical mandates are seen as absolutes, or at least some of them are, maybe not all of them. They often have the phrase, the Bible says it, I believe it. Um, I had an experience once where I encountered someone who was, uh, I was at a silent prayer vigil at a church with Soul Force that was working for inclusion of all God's children. And a woman came up with her floppy Bible, uh, who was a member of the church and started berating my friend who identified as a lesbian. And so I stepped in front of my friend and took on this woman myself. And I realized I'm not good at silent prayer vigils. Um, but I had to say something. So she was shaking the Bible, say, okay, so you say you believe and, and take the Bible literally. And she said, yes, I do every word. Genesis to Revelation. I said, okay, well, let me ask you a little question. When Jesus says, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor, it doesn't quite look like you've done that yet. And I can't make this up. She looked at me with a very sincere face and said, he didn't mean it literally. Okay. That's what uh, Peter Gomes, who was the former dean of the chapel at Harvard, who's now deceased, said, this is what we call being a selectivist. We all are selectivists. We all select texts that we think are more timeless and texts that are more time bound. The question is, how do you make that selection? Is it just that you take literally the texts that don't step on your toes and not literally those that do step on your toes? We call that in seminary life, having a hermeneutic. And for my understanding and what I try to teach is that we all have a hermeneutic that helps us select these texts, but it needs to be consistently applied all the time. And you need to be able to name that. Now, hermeneutic is just a fancy word for an interpretive framework that we read and interpret everything through it. But particularly today, we're talking about the Bible, applying it to all texts consistently. So you're not doing that. Well, I, I'm going to pick and choose what's literal and what isn't literal without being able to explain it to me. Um, and when we do talk about hermeneutic, we have to understand our reading location. What do we bring to the text? Because none of us are blank slates when we read the biblical text. Now, since I'm going to be interpreting biblical text with you for the rest of our time, I wanted to give you my hermeneutic, and you can kind of hold it, to, hold me to it as we work through these uh, passages. My hermeneutic is informed by the life and teachings of Jesus as they are recorded for us in the Gospels. And particularly when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment and what is the second greatest commandment? You may remember, he said the first commandment, the greatest commandment was love the Lord your God with all your heart, being, and strength, or I like to say love God with all you are. He didn't make that up on the spot. That comes from Deuteronomy 6, 5. And actually, that was a pretty common answer for any Jewish person when asked about the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Again, not a new idea. It comes right from Leviticus 19 of all places. So when I read texts, I ask the question, does this text help me to love God with all I am and to love my neighbor as myself? If the answer is no, I don't get to throw it out. I'm not Thomas Jefferson creating my own Bible. I have to work and interpret it to try and figure out why that text is there. What was going on? Why would the authors want to make that statement claiming that God wanted them to kill all the Canaanites? If I read something and I think it does help me love God with all I am and love my neighbor as myself, I have to work even harder because I need to make certain in my interpretation that I am not making the text say what I want it to say. So when it says, love the stranger, you were once strangers, 
that does seem to fit the bill of helping me love God and love my neighbor as myself. So let's look at it closer and make certain I understand the context and what it meant before I make it into what I want it to mean. All right, that's it on that basic stuff. We're going to dive into the topic of the hour, which is sex. And we're going to start with sex in the Hebrew Bible, Christian Old Testament. A um, couple of things we need to know about sex that Christians, I think, thanks to St. Augustine, are a little off on. Sex in the Hebrew Bible is not inherently bad. It's actually a God-given blessing when shared between adults who are consenting. If you think about it, the first commandment given to humans in the Genesis 1 story is to be fruitful and multiply, which is, in essence, a command to have sex. Sex was understood as companionship. It had the potential to be a sacred act. And we see this when you read the Song of Songs, or also known as the Song of Solomon, because we have their erotic poetry about two lovers. And even though it doesn't talk about God, it's understood that the divine is part of that behavior, those actions, etc. Now, if you want to tell kids, just say no to sex, that might work, but I find it more powerful to say, hey, whatever you're doing in the back seat, remember God's right there with you. Um, also, a good thing to get uh, youth to read the Bible is to give them a snippet of Song of Songs and then tell them to go read it. And well, it's hard to find to begin with, so they're going to read some other things in the Bible. But then once they start reading that, they're going to love to read the Bible because they know that there's sex and they'll also find out violence and all these other things, as well as wisdom and compassion and commandments about justice. But like any gift, sex has the potential to be harmful when it's used to abuse or devalue another person. When we talk about sex in the Hebrew Bible, you know, the, the context uh, within which these texts were part of stories, part of written material collected, compiled of the ancient Near East, um, we have to get a sense of how Israel understood procreation. Now, in the ancient Near East, Israel was never a large population, even under Solomon. They were not the biggest people in the ancient Near East. Survival, then, of the people was a primary concern of ancient Israel. Life was precarious. A famine, a disease, a war could literally wipe them off the face of the earth. Add to that that for women, pregnancy and childbirth were very dangerous. Many women died in childbirth or even prior to that. And so, you know, women had to reproduce even though they were risking their lives. Infant mortality was high. Some estimates 90% or more of infants did not make it to the age of one back then. So you had to have as many children as possible in order to get some that would become adults and continue the lineage and the people. So Israel was at first an agrarian agricultural society, and their understanding of reproduction really comes from that agrarian context. They seem to have understood that the male seed we would call it sperm today. They didn't even know sperm existed. But the male seed had everything necessary to create a new human being. The woman was merely the field in which the seed was planted. If the seed was planted and a child grew and was born, and particularly if it were a boy child in that culture, who got the credit? The man did. If the seed was planted in the field and it grew and became a girl child, who was blamed? The woman. And if the seed was planted and no child was uh, produced, then the woman got all of the blame. And that's why they're called barren, like a barren field. They couldn't, they were seen as the problem that couldn't produce children. So keep that in mind that seed has to be directed at the potential for creating a new human life. And spilling seed was really bad. 
If you want to read Genesis 38, there's a story there about a man who decided not to fulfill his obligation to produce a child with his uh, deceased brother's widow. And when he spilled his seed on the ground, God struck him dead. Kind of a little uh, teaching moment there. So when we talk about homosexuality in the Hebrew Bible, we have to remember that there was no word in biblical Hebrew for homosexuality. The same is true for Greek and Aramaic. In fact, homosexuality did not become a word in English until the late 19th century CE. So clearly there were people who were attracted to members of the same uh, sex group, et cetera. So either the biblical writers assumed everyone was heterosexual, which I doubt greatly, or they were only concerned with seed. Um, and so that's why, as I like to say, it's good news for lesbians because there's no prohibition against women having an intimate relationship, only men, because no seed was spilled when two women are having that intimacy. And they certainly didn't have the concepts of gender identity and sexuality that we have in the 21st century. We do know in the ancient world, there were same-sex acts. Now hear that carefully. Not We're not talking about LGBTQIA persons who are attracted to others for loving relationships. These were acts that were not about love and relationships. Many times when an army would conquer another army, they would then rape the conquered soldiers. It was debasing to them to be raped because primarily they saw it as with the men being on the receiving end, they were acting the part of a woman, which was a horrible insult to men. And we know that that kind of same-sex act wasn't about love. Rape is about power and violence. We know that some religions in the ancient world had ritual sex acts that were part of their uh, religion, usually around things like uh, fertility of humans as well as the earth. And we know particularly in Greco-Roman culture that some men would keep young boys for their sexual pleasure. It was called pederasty. And today we would call that pedophilia. Again, not about loving relationships, but about power or violence. So let's move into these clobber passages. The first one is God created Adam and Eve and not Adam and Steve. You may have seen one of those signs when there was a picketing of a church or a funeral or whatever. It's a catchy phrase, but it really doesn't have any legs to stand on. The two creation stories in Genesis we have to remember are about how the world was begun and how the earth got populated. And in the ancient world, the only way to reproduce was with one male and one female. So in that first story, when God creates humankind in the divine image, God creates them male and female, which are biological terms. And again, a male and female was necessary to be fruitful and multiply. In the second version of a creation story, you know, the one where God creates that Adam out of the dirt, the Adama, and then realizes that Adam needs a partner and nothing, no animal will work. And the text in Hebrew says that God took Adam and split it in half and created out of it a man, Ish, and a woman, Isha, again, built into the context of reproduction, family, relationship. Um, it was. It's interesting to read Jewish Midrash about these um, Adam creatures. I'm not gonna go through all this, but the rabbi said, maybe that first creature had no sex organs. Others say they had both sex organs. One theory or one Midrash was that that first human was created with two sides. One had female genitalia, one had male genitalia. And when God split them apart, they saw that they were no longer alone. And in my mind, that really talks about how we are created in this world to find a person who helps us be all that the Holy created us to be. And then we help them. 
to be all that the holy created them to be. And it's not about whether it's male or female. It's about that companionship, that completeness. All right. Now we move to the next text that gets most of the place, Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. Um, the problem is lots of people read Genesis 19 in isolation, and you really have to read it as part of that ancestral saga about Sarah and Abraham. And in particular, read Genesis 18. At the end of Genesis 18, after the visitors have told Sarah and Abraham that Sarah's going to have a child at 90, and she laughed and we won't go down that road. It's another story and another lesson. But then you remember those three guests that we know are angels, but the humans don't know that in the story. They walk on and one, two of them go on to Sodom and Gomorrah to see if the news they've heard about how bad Sodom and Gomorrah is, is true. And then Abraham and God have this um bargaining scene where God tells Abraham, I'm going to wipe out Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham says, well, what if there are 40 righteous people? And God says, okay, I'll save them for that. And Abraham gets God down to, if there's just 10 righteous or innocent people, God will not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Note that we don't know yet what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah is. But what we do know is the story of 18 and 19 in Genesis are about the ancient custom of hospitality, which was crucial in the ancient world because they didn't have hotels. It was not safe to travel after dark alone. You needed water, you needed food, and you needed protection. And the cultures back then, and particularly Israel's culture, saw hospitality as a holy obligation. So when we turn to Genesis 19, we might wonder, why is Lot out in the city gates? Is he waiting to see if strangers come so he can offer them hospitality? In Genesis 19, then the strangers come to the city and Lot convinces them that it's not safe to stay in the city square. So they come to his house. He gives them food and water and shelter and protection. And the text says, before they lay down, um, that the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house and called out to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. Now, I won't read the rest of the story, but let's just say Lot is not father of the year in this story. But there's an interesting piece about how that bold text has been translated over the years. As it reads right now, it sounds like only the men of the city were outside Lot's door wanting to have sex, because I think that's what no means, with men. And that's part of the whole creation of this myth of what Sodom and Gomorrah was about. However, when I went back to the Hebrew and read the context of it, it really renders better in this way. When the people of the city, the people of Sodom, from the youngest to the eldest, all the people of Sodom to the last one surrounded the house. That's a different scene. That means everybody in town is outside demanding that Lot send out these two visitors so they can essentially gang rape them. Now, why is that important? Well, how many innocent people would it take to save Sodom and Gomorrah? 10. If only the men were out the door and the women and children were at home, then God didn't keep God's word. But this translation helps us understand that the whole city was a part of this scene. Now we all can talk about what children being brought into that were about, but this is how they treat the stranger in their midst. Rather than welcoming them, giving them food and drink and shelter, they want to abuse them so that they won't stay. They won't hang around. Again, I've talked a bit about this already with the outsiders to know that it was all the people to the last one. And still, we don't quite have a name for the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. But when we see those cities referenced in the rest of the, the Bible, we do find some sins listed, and they include greed, abusive behavior, which I think gang rape would fit that category, 
idolatry and inhospitality. Notice nothing about men wanting to have sex with men. And if we weren't convinced yet, remember when Jesus told his disciples that a if a city didn't welcome them to shake off the dust from their sandals because it would be better in the day of judgment for Sodom and Gomorrah than for that city, Jesus is showing us that Sodom and Gomorrah were the epitome of inhospitality. The next two texts we have are uh, Leviticus passages, and I'm going to run through this first part because there's a lot more detail here than we have time to do, but just a couple of things. One, these 613 commandments were only meant for Israel to help set them apart from the rest of the world, and it was not a buffet law code. You couldn't pick and choose which of the 16, 613 commandments you were going to keep. It was an all or nothing game. And I might throw in here that I think somebody told Christians that we are no longer bound to these 613 commandments. And yet some people still want to hold on to a couple of them at least. Also, the Bible tells us in a story about um, the daughters of Zahel, Zahel, Zelophehad and the changing of inheritance laws that Israel knew that the laws, the commandments were not written in stone. They were meant to adapt and change with time. The book of Leviticus is really one of the more boring books in the Bible. It's about the teachings for the priests and teachings of the priests for the people. It was very concerned with cultic rituals and how to properly carry those out. Um, there are only two little narratives in the text. Uh, most of it is just commandment. Um, it has unity, if you look closely, of how the commandments are grouped together. And the first 16 chapters are addressed to the priests, and the rest of the book is addressed to the people. Among these commandments in Leviticus chapter 17 through chapter 26, we find what is called the holiness code, a set of commandments that are really about this holiness. And we might say about how to maintain tahor, ta'ara, rather than become transformed into tame. In this holiness code, we find commandments that require a child be killed if they curse their parent. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be here today if we still followed this commandment. Anyone guilty of adultery would be killed. I think Hollywood and Washington, D.C. would be less populated if we still kept that law. A daughter of a priest who engages in prostitution should be killed. We don't even know what to do with that one. And then the last one that often gets younger people is, um, or no, sorry, not this, uh, the the text says anyone who uses the Lord's name for something the Lord doesn't want to be attached to should be killed. This is more than just saying the GD word. This is saying using God as a justification for something God wouldn't want to be a part of. What the holiness code prohibits is you, you can't have heterosexual intercourse with a menstruating woman. You can't harvest the corners of a field. You can't crossbreed livestock. You can't eat fruit from a young tree. But the one that gets young people is this one. No tattoos. Those were strictly prohibited. Now, again, if we aren't following all of the commandments, we don't have to follow that one either. Though I have to laugh when students ask me, I want to get a tattoo of a Hebrew word. And I just kind of go, well, maybe we need to talk about that. And then one I would love to follow, you can't charge interest on a loan, but I don't think my mortgage company would agree to that one. So the two texts in Leviticus are 18.22 and 20 verse 13. They're translated, uh, you shall not lie with males with a woman. That's a masculine you. It is an abomination. And the second one in Leviticus 20.13, if a man lies with a male as with a woman, both have committed an abomination, shall be put to death, their blood is upon them. If you want a more word-for-word -word translation, the text actually says, with a male, you, again, masculine you, shall not lie the lying of a woman. It is an abomination. And Leviticus 20 says, if a man lies with a male, the lying of a woman. 
Now, what's going on here? Well, first, if it's two men having intercourse, you're wasting seed. And that was strictly forbidden. The other thing, though, is that phrasing, the lying of a woman. In this scenario, one of the men has to be on the receiving end, which makes them play the part of a woman. And for a male back then, that would have been seen as a great disgrace. And that's just two commandments out of 613. And notice right between these two commandments in Leviticus 19 is love your neighbor as yourself, which is what Jesus said was the second greatest commandment. The word abomination often gets held up as like God's worst sin. I had a pastor call my lesbian friend, you're an abomination of God. Well, abomination is the Hebrew word to'avah. It really has to do with what brings about ritual impurity or what makes you tame. And it is not the worst sin because there are a lot of things named as abomination in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, for instance, eating a sacrifice at the wrong time is an abomination. But one that gets me, eating pork or shellfish is an abomination. So my bacon wrapped shrimp really is an abomination. Or seeing a menstruating woman naked is an abomination. So clearly, those who want to lift up that word out of context and say it's a horrible, horrible sin haven't read or understood what the word means. And this is about sex and uh, seed being spilled. And all of that would be something to consider for ritual purity and staying out or not becoming Tame. That's it in the Hebrew Bible. So let's move to the New Testament. Likewise, during the writing of the New Testament, the early Jesus movement was a minority group. And one of its greatest threats came from the Greco-Roman culture, especially their religions and the threat of assimilation. So also remember that Christianity or followers of the way was very new as a religion in the Greco-Roman culture. So they were also trying to prove their legitimacy and carve out their own identity so that early leaders like Paul tried to emphasize the sins of Greco-Roman culture, especially when they incorporated sexual behavior with their religious rituals. Anything that even came close to resembling the behavior of the culture was strictly prohibited for the new followers of the way. So in the New Testament, there's only a handful of texts as well. Romans 1, 26 to 27. Um, this is a passage when Paul is talking about what happens when people are become idolaters. And there's this these two verses that say, you know, for this reason, God gave them up to degrading passage, passions. Their women exchanged natural intercourse for unnatural in the same way men giving up natural intercourse with women, were consumed with passion for one another, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, we don't read the whole text, and I'll say a word about that later. But first, you notice natural and unnatural are in italics. Particularly unnatural is the he a Greek phrase parathizin, which really is better translated as unconventional, unconventional or unusual. Paul uses the same phrase in 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen in referring to men with long hair. That's not unnatural. It just wasn't the convention of the time. What we see described here is probably thing, a sexual orgy um, that would have seemed like some of the Greek religious practices and cultural pac, uh, practices, which Paul deemed pagan. These people were guilty of idolatry and their behavior became unconscionable. The other things listed are things like envy and gossip, but we don't pick those up because that might hit too close to home. Also, this is a text referring to heterosexuals going against their natural orientation. Um, not It's not about the natural physical expressions of love and intimacy by LGBTQIA plus persons. Um, probably we're looking at adultery here, and that too would have been prohibited. Then there are two texts that I call sin inventories about who gets to inherit the kingdom of God. First Corinthians 6, 9 to 10, 
1 Timothy 1, and that should be 9 to 10 as well. I got that uh, typo I haven't taken out. Um, this is about who's not going to get into the kingdom. And so we read in the first one, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, sodomites, thieves, the greedy, drunkards, revilers, etc. The second one, um, the godless, the sinful, the unholy, the profane, kill their mother or father, murder, fornicate, sodomites, slave tra traders, liars, perjurers, whatever else is contrary to the sound teaching. Notice nobody wants to emphasize being greedy as something that prohibits you from inheriting the kingdom of God. So let's look at these words. The word translated as sodomites is the Greek word arsenokoitai, and it has nothing to do with Sodom. Remember, homosexuality wasn't a Greek word. This word, arsenokoitai, we think is a compound word that means male beds and may be talking about male prostitutes or even sacred prostitution, which Paul would have said was a no-no. Also, that word translated as male prostitutes is the Greek word malakoi, which means soft and really has to do with being lazy or weak. Notice we don't want to say that being lazy will keep us out of the reign uh, kingdom of God. It also has some sexist implications about women being soft. You, you accuse a man of being soft, you're calling him a woman. Most of Many of the most recent translations of the Bible have used homosexual or sodomite in these passages. Um, even the NRSV, considered by many to be a very accurate translation, uses sodomites for the word. The previous revised standard version used sexual perverts. And actually the King James doesn't use sodomites either. I happen to know someone or who's now deceased that was on the translation committee for the new revised standard version. And he told the story of how this was really a bargaining table issue. One group wanted sodomite when they knew that wasn't the right word and another group wanted something else and so it was basically we'll give you sodomite if you give us this i don't know what the this was i hope it was worth it because of all the violence and harm and danger that has been perpetrated against people in the lgbtqia plus community because of biblical translation mistakes like this the other text in the New Testament is Jude 7. Now that's not a typo because actually Jude is one chapter. So it's Jude verse 7. Um, this is a text where they talk about Sodom and Gomorrah as examples. And it is um, sexual immorality, as we said, on the one hand, gang rape and pursuing unnatural lust. And they are an example of what happens when you do those things. You are punished by fire. Now, the text didn't say eternal fire because that doesn't work in the Hebrew Bible mindset, but it does in the New Testament. Remember that the people receiving Jude would have known the story probably of Genesis 19. So they heard sexual immorality and remembered how they mistreated the strangers at Lot's house, the inhospitality, and the attempted gang rape. And the unnatural lust could have two opportunities. I like to think, though, that because they knew the story, they knew that the two visitors at Lot's house were actually angels, divine beings. And in the ancient mindset, it was not appropriate for humans and divine beings to have sex. Um, go back and look at Genesis 6 and, and the reasoning for the flood about the uh, sons of God mixing with the sons of our daughters of humans. So it was prohibited. So it wasn't about the same sexness. It was about the unnatural human to divine intercourse. As I like to tell uh, kids, especially, and they always love this, that's it. In the whole of the Christian canon, these are the only passages people have been trotting out as clobber passages without actually translating and interpreting them within their original context before we move into our 21st century context. Um, there are other things I haven't 
done much with, and I don't think I have a lot of time now. Um, but there is the passage Deuteronomy 22, 5, that's often uh, trotted out to speak against um, transsexuals, transvestites, or uh, cross-dressers about women not wearing men's apparel, et cetera. Um, really what's happening here is uh, some think that it it's a threat that if a man dresses up in female garb and goes into the female quarters, he might intend to rape the women. On the other side of it, if women dress up as men and go into the camp of an army, they might seduce those soldiers and make them more vulnerable to their enemy. Um, and it really is about, in Israel's mind, trying to keep things in categories. So as I said, men are the givers and women are the receivers in sex acts, and they like to identify some of them are women uh, clothing and men's clothing, though some of us don't think there was that big a difference between what a man wore and what a woman wore back then. And it isn't talking about prohibiting contemporary clothing that is often asexual clothing, goes both uh, ways or non-sexual clothing. And it's not talking about gender identity as we know it today. So um, that's all I have. And we have a little time for questions or comments. I'm going to slip up to this, which is my email address, so that if you want a copy of the handout that goes through all these passages and or a copy of these slides, you drop me an email. I am happy to send that to you, um, especially the handout I have told people. Just feel free to share with folks as you see fit. Now, I'm going to try and figure out how I find my uh, chat feature. When I'm in this mode, I always get a little weirded out by it all. But if you have a question, you can raise your hand. You can chat it uh, in the chat box. And um, I will try and find where that is. I think I may have to stop sharing my screen. Um, and again, if you didn't get my email, all you have to do, to go, do is go to ptstulsa.edu and find my name and you'll get my email. So any comments or questions with the time that we have left? Um, before um, those of us who are in Tulsa move on to the dinner tonight. Those of us who are joining the whole event virtually, I'm really glad that we were able to make that accessible to you and that you were willing to give it a shot. So questions or comments? And since I don't see faces, I'm just assuming you're still awake and you're still there. It's okay not to have a question or comment, but I like to give the opportunity for it. Any questions or comments? No? Going once, going twice. I do appreciate um, you spending time with me and listening to me talk. Um, as I said, I know it has to be fast and I hate that. I'd much rather spend time engaging with you as we work through these texts. Um, I am willing if anyone has a congregation that would like to have this uh, presentation, I am willing to do it just like this via Zoom so I don't have to travel to your congregation. And um, you can email me about that. I'm doing one for a church in Houston in a couple of weeks. Uh, via Zoom. All right. Well, I appreciate you and uh, send me an email if you want the handout and the slides. And I wish you a very good evening um, and uh, hope that wherever you are, that you are safe and warm and uh, enjoying being with people you love. Have a great night. Thank you very much.